Uh, if I had to choose between a single self, multiplicity, and none at all, I would opt for number two. That, uh, and multiplicity is probably a lot more complicated than simply um, um, a diversity at some level of ontology. Rather, I think there are multiplicities within different ontologies or metaphysics or whatever word you want to use. That is, there are different aspects of the self that can be known or the self that might be conceived of as instantiated in the brain uh, or in neural function. And there's also aspects of the self that I don't think are, I don't think there are any bridging laws that enable us to reduce it to neural function. Maybe there will be, but that's a promissory note. We don't know that, but the self of consciousness, subjectivity, first person subjectivity uh, is another aspect of self. And I think without that, all the neural functioning uh, offerings and representations, whatever you want to call it, uh, amount to very little. I think, you, uh, I guess, Ficht, or however you pronounce F-I-C-H-T-E, uh, his idea that no subject without object, no object without subject, to me makes a lot of sense with regard to the self. I don't know, it's very hard to talk about something that doesn't have any material features for uh, uh, humans, um, oh, which I count myself one. And um, I posit or stipulate um, taking a, a view that is not uncommon in some areas of philosophy, that uh, the self of first person subjectivity uh, is not a multiplicity, but rather more of a, um, immaterial, unchanging um, aspect of the whole. I've written on, on that explicitly, and we're talking about uh, what makes uh, someone the same person over time. Uh, so we're talking about diachronicity or self as a temporal con continuant. Um, I think that you can take a Lockean perspective and say that there, uh, the self ha it, it, it consists in uh, psychological connectivity or continuity, but I think as soon as you do that you run into circularity problems that Thomas Reed identified and you also run into uh, just simply counter evidence, evidence of people who um, <clears throat> um, um, don't remember things yet maintain a, a coherent sense of who they are. I think this gets back to the idea that there's not a self uh, to be known, but there's a multiplicity of selves. Um, I think what gives us our sense of personal continuity is not the evidence, that is, the memorial evidence. We can use that if we want to, and psychologists, I think, overstate the importance of that in everyday life. I think we just have a sense of personal continuity, even if we lack the ability to evidentially support it. I work with patients who do not have the ability, for instance, to remember what they have done at any point in their entire life, but they still have a sense of personal continuity. I don't think there is one sense of personal continuity, different ways of imagining oneself to be a temporal continuant. One's an evidential sense, which they can't do, they can't tell you why they are, but they still have a feeling that I do exist, I have existed and I will exist, and I don't think it's given by the material or psychological aspects of the self, but something that's more a first-person subjectivity that is there, doesn't change, and remains. I mean, when you think about it, interestingly, uh, and maybe this is not that interesting, but it's interesting to me that um, <clears throat> most material features of our body age, and they change over time, and we, we, we go to a great extent to do things about that. We get glasses, we worry about our wrinkles, we, um, we lose our memories. What, what, we, what we don't lose is our subjectivity. Um, you know, uh, it's very common for people to say things like, gee, I, I don't feel much different on my 80th birthday than I felt on my 24th birthday. We don't have products. We don't worry about people losing their sense of being uh, until they're no longer being. And I, I think that provides us with this sort of anchoring that I do exist and I will exist and it does not depend on, although we can use evidence from our 
memories and uh, our sense organs. We don't need to do that to feel like we are here and will be here. I tend to think that it's pre-reflective. That doesn't mean it can't be conceptual. Uh, I think that's how we deal with it scientifically, but I think experientially that is not the case. It can be experienced. We can be asked for evidence. We can be in an environment that requires us to provide evidence, or we can just be personally curious. But I think we proceed on a day-to-day -day basis without having to worry about these things at all unless we're in a psychology experiment or we're trying to explain ourselves to somebody else or for some reason we want to explain ourselves to ourselves. Episodic memory is a memory that's relatively recently evolved, so the hypothesis goes. The hypothesis is also that mostly uh, seen in humans, maybe some higher primates like bonobo chimps. Um, it is the ability that we have to not only know something, but to know how we know, so we can mentally time travel back to the experience in which we acquired the information. I remember that um, just before I came up here, I had a soda. So it has a temporal, spatial, and self-referential component, and I can relive those things. Semantic long-term memory, which can be maintained even in the absence of episodic long-term memory, is knowledge divorced from the where, what, and whens. So I know that um, 2 plus 2 is 4. Uh, how did I learn that? What was the experience in which I acquired that information? No idea. If I did have an idea, then I'd have an episodic memory of that. They affect it in different ways because the way I visualize it is there's a sense of self or a consciousness or a first person awareness which has intentional objects or things of which it uh, <clears throat> is the receptacle. That's a very bad metaphor. Um, but we have offerings from different aspects of memory which provide different aspects of ourselves. I study patients who cannot remember a single thing they've ever said or done in their entire lives. But they still have a full sense of what they are like because they know things about themselves even if they can't remember the basis on which they know those things. And I think this again gets back to the multiplicity question. There is no single evidential offering about ourselves. There are many different sources, some of which can be impaired and others which can remain intact. Um, contra Locke's argument that if one was born, uh, woke up one day without a sense of what he or she had been doing for the last 50 years, they'd lose their sense of self. Um, I have people who have no memories of anything they've been doing, and they're still very well aware of who they are. They may not be able to tell you what they've done, but they can talk to you about their plans. Uh, they can even tell you what they did, and not specifically what they did, but in a, a more general way, I was an engineer. I drove this car. They may not be able to remember times they drove the car or remember behaving as an engineer. So there's different kinds of memories and they provide different aspects of our self-knowledge that all can be presented to uh, our self as um, subjectivity. <clears throat> and um, you can lose some and not the others. And of course, it's going to impact your uh, what you can say about yourself. but um, it doesn't mean that if you lose X, where X is episodic memory, there will no longer be anything to offer to subjectivity vis-a-vis -vis the self. Well, it, it, it depends on the stage of Alzheimer's, but in, let's say, late stage Alzheimer's, uh, you know, stage four, somewhere up there where they're really uh, seriously impaired. They tend to be impaired episodically in terms of memory. They don't remember what they were doing 10 minutes ago. Uh, one woman I worked with showed me her room five times in, 20, uh, 20 in, in 48 minutes. Did you see my room? No. We saw it again. Did you see my room? No. We saw it again. And she didn't remember she'd done that. But, but semantically she also had impairments. I would show her a, a pencil and say, what is this? She'd say, I don't know. Is it a file for talking? Which is interesting because 
Uh, a pencil, of course, is a way of communicating, and files and talking are always a commu Okay, so she had some knowledge, but she couldn't identify it. If I showed her a glass, she might say it's a glass. If I showed her a watch, I have no idea. So she was losing her general knowledge. Um, interestingly, if I asked her what she was like, she would tell me what she was like. I would give her a list of traits. Does this describe you, Kay? Does this describe you? Does this describe you? And she would say yes or no, or actually it was a more complicated scale, and we helped her if she needed to with the meanings of the words, but it turned out she didn't need help with those words because she didn't lose all her language. Uh, people don't lose all their semantic memory unless they're dead. Um, <clears throat> and um, we asked her again a month later, and she circled the same words. But they were reliable, but not accurate. People said, this doesn't describe her in the least. And that's, this fits, of course, with the idea that um, people with Alzheimer's dementia lose their sense of self. But that is a misinterpretation in the following sense. She didn't lose her sense of self. She lost her current sense of self. Because when we asked her not, what are you like now, but what were you like 20 years ago when you were a teacher? And she answered those questions. And then other people who knew her when she was a teacher looked at them. They said, exactly right. She couldn't update, but she still knew what she was like. And probably as the disease progressed, that would be lost too. But um, there is no one set of self-knowledge that can be provided to the subjective self as the definitive, this is me. I don't know. I've written recently on this and argued that we need to stop um, um, abstracting the wholeness of reality into quantitative formalisms that works fine for some things, but it doesn't work well for experiential reality. And I think experiential reality is part of reality. I think if we define reality wholly as material, unless we stretch the meaning of material, we've defined away an important aspect of reality. In fact, that aspect of reality that makes science possible, um, the, uh, the part of reality that includes the mind that has and makes and interprets science. Um, I think introspection needs to be accorded a, a bigger role, and I think that's happening. But ultimately, I think we need a different metaphysics, and a metaphysics in which um, science, which adopts this as a metaphysics, often without stating it or thinking about it, is entirely uh, materialistic. But in most Western psychology, sciences, and philosophies, we need to be more inclusive, to uh, accept that there are certain things that are not subject to quantification and objectification in the same ways that the weight of a brick is. And we probably need to develop, it doesn't mean we need to abandon science, but we need to have new methodologies. If the methodologies we have don't work, so much the worse for the methodology, we don't throw out the facts of experience. Uh, I mean, a good example is um, if you ask someone to remember something, and they remember something, we reduce it to a number recalled, or the order recalled, but the actual memory experience is far richer than that. I remember it, I have feelings, I have associations, all these things, they're not captured by an abstraction. And we then take the whole of reality to be actually the part that we've abstracted because it's scientifically, current scientific, tractable. I don't think this means science is wrong, I just think current science is overly restrictive. Uh, I think it means we extend the idea of naturalization. I don't think it means we throw out the, pro the project. I think we uh, more closely examine what we mean by naturalizing. And I think our current view of naturalization is laboring under the dogma that everything naturalized is therefore physical or material. Uh, there's absolutely no epistemic or ontological warrant for that ass assumption. There's no evidence that that's the case. It's simply a conceit. And it may be true, I don't know. But until someone demonstrates logically or experimentally that the whole of reality is assumable by material aspects, um, I don't see why we have to assume naturalization must be a materialistic or naturalization. No, I don't think you have to, though. I mean, take uh, there's no there's no reason A to be a dualist. That's a, a stipulation that there's A and B, but it could be A, B, C, and D. Or one could have a reality in which it's multifaceted. It's a pluralism. 
in which reality consists of multiple facets in addition to things that we can see and touch or uh, measurably see and touch. It's great for science, as done. It's been incredibly successful. Most of my careers are based on it. But I think uh, just because it's good for science doesn't mean that it's therefore exhaustive of reality and will give us a full appreciation of reality. Certainly, it's, uh, it's undeniable. Without science, I wouldn't be here uh, answering your questions uh, and looking into a camera. Um, but just because something does not easily submit to the material um, predilections of a scientific approach does not mean that therefore it forfeits its claim to be um, an object that we should be concerned or an object that's the same, an aspect that we should be concerned about.